Uh, thank you, Ishmael, and uh, delighted to be here uh, back in uh, Level 39 in Canary Wharf, uh, where I've had uh, kind of quite an enjoyable professional experience over the last few years. Um, the title of my talk today is kind of banking as we know it, kind of may it rest in peace. And basically, a lot of the conversation that we had this morning is saying there is kind of a turning point happening, and that's what I'd like to explore today. How do we kind of you know, do an RIP and kind of bury some of the models? And I think one of the most important things that why this thing is changing is that I believe that banks have really forgotten about their customers. And the uh, last speaker from Lloyd's was really kind of saying we need to go back to some of the fundamentals. And I think if we put the customer uh, front and center to how we uh, operate as an industry, whether that's in the raw tech startup, fintech startup, or the big, more established banks, and again, whether that's Main Street or Wall Street, I think if we start putting the customer first and center, we may have a hope of surviving and growing and evolving as, as the industry. So. Uh, today's topics, kind of, my initial one is about uh, loyalty and passion, and it's not kind of two words that you hear an awful lot about banking passion, but it's something I think we need to talk about to kind of give it uh, context. And then go on to about creation, loyalty and passion and creation, kind of, the, it'd be kind of a lot of uh, suggestive words here, but kind of creation and co-creation, uh, like what Apple has achieved in its industry and completely changed that model. Uh, looking at some of the challenges and challenges that face this industry, particularly in the retail side of things, and then the opportunities therein, and then take a different twist on uh, rest in peace to give something that will have hope uh, for this industry. Now, if we look at, say, the top 50 brands in the world, um, all, a lot of them are, are, are very recognizable. But the thing for people in this industry is that there's only five kind of really global bank, banks uh, in the top 50 uh, in the world, which is when, when there's something that's so important because we use finance every day, whether it's kind of buying coffee, paying bills, or so forth, but for something that's so important in our everyday life that they're not as kind of high up in the stakes as one would imagine. And if you look at kind of brands in general, uh, the key thing that kind of sets them apart is this kind of, kind of loyal, the loyalty and passion they have, and this kind of, this kind of emotional connectedness that great brands have. And you know, the example is kind of, you know, why would we pay a lot of money for a BMW when you could go to another model to have something that is functionally uh, kind of the same? And this is the thing I think that stands things around. And the, the banking industry with that we in is not synonymous with this kind of irrational and kind of uh, behavior, except an irrational that we put up with an awful lot of stuff uh, in the service providers. And, and of course, kind of the big example that everyone likes to use is kind of uh, Apple. You know, why do people queue, over, queue uh, for the new products when they could wait 24 hours and get that product down the, down the road in kind of PC uh, world or curries? And it is because there's something irrational about it. And again, very hard to describe. But that's what makes big kind of brands differently. And in the case of Apple, they were able to extend this kind of irrational kind of behavior to launch iTunes. And from iTunes then uh, set up kind of the iPhone and then this whole kind of uh, app uh, economy, such as like over 100 now, 100 billion um, kind of downloads to date on their app, from their app store. Their app revenue, 15 billion. And of that, 10 billion went to developers. So a whole new world, but again, it, it was based on they were able to leverage, you know, their kind of their core um, um, customer base that was irrational about their loyal to the to the brand that got them through a very very dark patch. But then they were able to again leverage that into this whole new uh, company that we all kind of love and, and adore. So this is kind of, you know, kind of something that I suppose gives us inspiration if we look at the kind of exemplar of kind of completely turning their business model on their head and doing something new. And of course, they kind of created all of these kind of products and services that we're, we in the more established industry, and it's not just in financial services, most established um, industries, whether it's in newspapers or traditional retail, are really struggling to try and figure out how do we kind of copy something like Apple. So it's not just a, a traditional banking problem. It's most traditional industries are really struggling at both board level and next level down. How do we kind of respond to this kind of new world? And likewise, kind of Google's was a fast follower in this kind of co-created environment, but went very, very fast. You know, so it is also in the 60 billion downloads, kind of obscene numbers, huge revenue, huge amount of apps, 
and Facebook uh, following very, very fast. You know, so like you know, Facebook users on average worldwide 20 minutes uh, per day, and in America I think it's up to about 40 minutes. You know, which we would, which most industries would kind of say die for. But this is kind of, you know, the kind of this kind of co-created system is in co-created ecosystem is this new world, which as I said most in, most traditional industries, not just banking, financial services are trying to kind of say cope with. In the B2B space, companies like uh, Salesforce, you know, and their whole app exchange are providing um, a, a, an ecosystem so that people can plug in to do it. And the, I think the 2014 numbers, they're up to about three, three million uh, installs. So like, again, the, the whole hockey curve uh, is going uh, pretty phenomenal. So, it gives, so it's not just a consumer play. There is real kind of business to business uh, kind of stuff going on here. So who are these kind of people created, creating this kind of helping the apples and doing this kind of co-created environment? And there is an icon here, is, you know, they can be uh, kind of individual kind of hobbyists or full professional teams, but they are the ones that are working in these Apple environments to kind of create the products and services, these new products and services um, that hitherto had not been available. And I suppose from a banking perspective, you know, what is this thing app? If you still go into the senior levels of most of the banks here and you talk about app, you're talking something big. It's an application. It's an enterprise application. In this kind of co-creative world, an app is something that does one thing very, 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 very well. So the mindset is very, very different. Again, in big banks, when you think of an app, it's 20 million. Are you, it's not worth kind of going up, <laughs> up the line and creating the business case. The app world, though, is something, how can we do something fast? speed of delivery, something new. So we're talking maybe 20,000 or nothing versus the 20 million. So the cultural shift that needs to go on in banks to kind of cope with this app world where we don't have to spend 20 million just to get the attention of the senior management and push things through, that maybe we should be able to experiment, do small. And yeah, when we get things kind of working and we bring it back into the organization and we smother it in kindness and we smother it in compliance and we smother it in kind of operational excellence, some of these things may kind of ultimately end up being a good big spend to operationalize it and make it fit for purpose within the type of world we are. But we need to shift from, you know, how can we do something small, fast, iterate, fail, all of those type of good buzzwords that we hear so that we can then kind of give the products and services to our customers. A recent study driven uh, by an, at the European Union funded was saying that this whole world uh, there's a whole new industry kind of up there where they reckon there was going to be about 5 million of these developers out there in the world creating or kind of co-creating this environment to provide products and services. So I kind of borrowed the kind of the minion kind of uh, um, cartoon as saying that they are the army of developers that are going to kind of help this or that is driving this co-created kind of say world. So just kind of an interesting uh, one. So within um, kind of co-created ecosystems, what are the kind of main questions for financial services? And I'd pr say there are roughly three. Kind of what are, the what are the challenges currently facing the banks that say, suggest that their business model is under threat and they need to do something different as in the co-created environment? And then kind of how can they draw inspiration uh, from companies like Apple and Google so that they can kind of, kind of provide the products and services that their customers want? And then should they copy uh, the Apples and the Googles and the Facebook so forth and create their own basically app store again to provide the products and services that customers want? So the main f challenge I suppose facing today's uh, banks is that uh, like quite numerous I think the one, big one is that the distribution model, the branch network is kind of uh, physically constrained, very costly and very hard to scale. Customers in most of their digital experience, except in banking, have a great experience. So you know you can go on. You know the the, the bad boy, the airline industry, Ryanair, for a long time was saying, you know, you know, you did it our way, we get it, and they've completely changed. Saying it's good to be good to customers. You know, so the 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 experience, the digital experience, and even the customer experience now of Ryanair is so much different from it was two two years ago. They figured out that needed to change. So in most of our lives. If we want to do something from booking a flight to you know, buying something online, it's pretty good, except when we have to go into uh, our bank. Right, there's one of the big banks here, and I have an account with them, and I have to remember some 
four letter code that they gave me, then combine it with my birthday. So that's just the first one. And then they have uh, another big complicated code to do it, and they give it vertically. And I really, every time I have to change my head this way because my brain can't switch. And it tells me, you know, give me my second, my third, and my fourth. And I still, you know, several years later, I think I'm turning my head as I'm trying to, to now it was brilliant from an engineering perspective, but absolutely sucks from a customer, a user experience. So, you know, so that's kind of not picking, you know, but it's, this is the type of thing that we need to kind of say change. How do we do things differently? So to not necessarily delight, but at least, at least be at the races when it comes to kind of the customer experience. And of course, the competitors are eating away. We might, you know, the Church of England may have a major problem with Wonga, but at least it was absolutely disruptive in what it was trying to do. And forgetting the ethics of it, it completely changed the whole kind of payday loan. You know, Stripe, and it, we're on, the previous talk was on about PayPal. You know, who would have ever decided to set up a competitor against Stripe? What the boys in Stripe did was incredible documentation. So, you know, the last ex speakers are talking about how bad the, the documentation was with PayPal. Stripe is fantastic. And that might, may have been their competitive advantage to win over, over easy acceptance by developers. You know, Square Ripples, you know, international settlement in, is it five seconds or five minutes? Phenomenal. Where are the custodian banks going to happen? Um, currency fair in terms of X, FX. And there's a whole other bunch of competitors. You know, the bread and butter, so to speak, uh, of traditional retail banking is being eaten away. Betterment in terms of, you know, kind of savings and investments and so forth, using kind of very, very kind of easy and intuitive, you know, that bring me from a journey. My age is, my income is this, that. These are the types of stocks and shares. Nutmeg the same. You know, so they're kind of all eating at the edges, kind of in one way is the easy stuff. But if it's hollowing out the middle, there's a big problem because the bank works on kind of, I suppose, a certain volume of money going through the system that it can kind of uh, pay for the big kind of, say, costs and so forth. And again, you know, the, again a branch network, you know, 50% of their operational cost of the bank goes to the network. And it's not open 24-7. And an awful lot of the locations were, you know, there for a long time, but are they fit for purpose today? The, the banks and services, you know, we banks, as I've just kind of said, we make it very hard for kind of customers to love us because we put on this compliance and regulation and all of that. You know, we, we kind of in banking expose all of our internal processes or kind of foist them onto our customers. The, it, yes, compliance and KYC and all of those need to work, but they should be kind of well buried not exposed onto it. So this is where kind of we need to rip it out. It, that needs to die, that whole kind of imposing our processes on top of our kind of, say, customers. And the technology and operations, you know, held together by Band-Aids, you know, over the last 40 or 50 years, layer upon layer of, you know, so as mentioned and all of those type of stuff, layer upon layer, an awful lot of the people were let go through kind of, you know, cost savings. And uh, nobody knows kind of, you know, who, what, what the system. And I think one of the second speaker today, the, the guy from AXA was on about, you know, kind of, you know, code field, you know, ZB, ABC. Who in God's name knows them anymore? We don't. And we've lost an awful lot of, I suppose, the kind of the corporate knowledge to kind of keep the systems up. And um, so that's kind of a major kind of, say, problem. But the opportunity then, though, in terms of the branch network, how can we do stuff differently? You know, various types of layout and, and types of location. <coughs> Full service to kind of low levels of service. Um, and I think one of the biggest, I suppose, challenges is that digital uh, banking is not kind of, say, binary. It's not, it's not one or the other. It has to be kind of a good blend of a bit of digital and a bit of physical if you're a full service bank. And then this perception of scale so that no matter where you are, say in Britain or across the world, if you're in work or, um, a customer of a bank that's kind of more global, that there is a perception of scale and I can get the products and services I need no matter where I am. And then it says the focus today, how do we design and kind of uh, and, and create new products and services that our customers want? And again, in terms of technology and operations, we shouldn't be kind of forcing our problems onto our customers. So, you know, when you go back then from the inspiration from the apples and so forth, why do uh, these minions, these third-party developers, love working with the apples and the, and the androids and so forth? And it's because they offer a huge customer base. And they, the apples and, and the Googles and, and so forth provide a, a platform where it, 
you know, the Apple, it sorts out the payment, it sorts out all of the rubbish, it sorts out all the headaches. So all the developer in one way needs to do is say, sign up to the SDKs and the T's and C's, and yes, Apple takes 30%, but move out then and kind of delight the customer. So they take an awful lot of the baggage, the headache, that a normal, if you're a small business person in terms of payment and so forth, Apple does that and they do very, very well. And of course, uh, the, these kind of networks, whether it's Apple and so forth, have huge data and customer analytics to share with the developers, you know, which kind of move things kind of say forward. And then it says, why would these same third party developers like to work with banks? And it's because we've got a huge, huge customer base with a low churn. Customers, so 60 million customers here in Britain, roughly 15 million, you know, for each for the, uh, for the four main banks. Not many people move from one to the other. You know, so, there's, um, so if I'm trying to develop a product or service from it, that's a good customer base to get after. And then the banks have huge, especially transactional history and knowledge about that customer. So if that can be shared with other developers, partners, and so forth, this is kind of a potential. But what do developers need? They want a platform. So they want to be able to kind of easily access into it. And then banks need to provide, and one of the great things about Apple, they have a huge governance infrastructure in place. So if you get your app in, you know it's good. Likewise, and this is what banks are very, very good at in terms of the operational governance, but governance in place so that because the sanctity and I suppose the trust of the transaction of the money is kind of held sacred, but then free up and let the developers kind of say do it. And again, it's access like all of the data vault, just the amount of data that banks tend to not kind of harvest well, but let other people do it. And again, ha have the you know, kind of data privacy and the, the, I suppose the respect and needs of the customer kind of looked after. And when I was writing that one, kind of da banks data want to break free, I was thinking of the Queen's, uh, Queen's song, you know, I want to break free. And I think this is, there's so much inside the organization, both in people and culture and data and so forth, that just wants to break out for these other uh, third party developers to, to work with. So one, so examples then of kind of where this is breaking free, you know, kind of uh, Teller, and so Stevie here, put up your hand, and he's speaking this afternoon. This is an example of kind of one company that's trying to kind of push the boundary, so to speak, of pulling together a lot of this transactional data, pulling together to his ecosystem, and then working with an awful lot of third party de developers, so, and then delighting the customer, because that's ultimately what we, what we need, kind of the whole value chain, how it works, that's another, you know, there's complexity and there's governance and all of that type of stuff. But an example, a very early stage startup that's trying to do this and push the boundaries big time. Uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, RBS and Ulster, and Ulster Bank being the uh, Irish kind of franchise uh, part of RBS in the last few years of saying, you know, how do we kind of change the culture? So we ran a bunch of hackathons, uh, in, one in Dublin and one in Belfast uh, with Ulster Bank. And it was to kind of show I suppose the exco on the board, the arts of the possible, that what can be created over a weekend when the bank gets out of the way and gets you know, the people kind of energized around ideas. And I mentioned to this, the CEO of the bank, says, we will not solve your problem this weekend, but we'll give you hope and kind of uh, comfort that there is something out there that's changed. And we worked with kind of Ishmael and Simon from Open Bank Project on that. In two weeks' time, uh, RBS is running a big hackathon up in Edinburgh. And Alan uh, is the kind of the lead from, Ulster, or from RBS on that. So feel free to kind of sign up with him. But again, it's just to kind of say pushing the boundaries. It's doing something different, leveraging, I suppose, the core of what the bank does, but getting out there with new products and services to try and make things happen. Other banks, and again, uh, th these are just samples. Um, uh, Credit Agricole in France have set up this kind of uh, whole kind of digital farm economy, and they're trying to figure out how do we get new products and services out there, trying to figure out kind of revenue share and all of that type of stuff. Interesting model. Uh, Citibank running, you know, and a lot of their PR, our, their press release saying, we do not know uh, how to kind of create the new products and services. Likewise, we get it very hard to attract technical talent into our organization. So by running these type of hackathons, we kind of do both. We figure out some new, new products and services that may have legs, but we also make it attractive for potential employees to come and work in our organization. And BBVA were mentioned earlier on as kind of the API bank. You know, so it's, you know, they're pushing the agenda big time. 
And one of the most kind of, I suppose, ridiculous examples of open innovation is the singing bank that the boys of the open bank project. What executive in any bank would sponsor a project saying, we're going to have happy music when you open up your account? They wouldn't, they wouldn't risk their career on it. But this is where this open kind of co-created environment, if somebody wants to do something like that, so in this example, if your balance is going in a positive direction, there's nice happy music. But if it's going in a negative direction, which probably is most of us, there's nice sad music, you know. But again, it goes back to no right person in, no person in their right mind would sponsor a project to say we're going to have that type of stuff. And I said, this is the cultural change. We need to do those silly things you know, that if it's kind of satisfy the customer need of one with a product of one, we as an industry have done it. So good example, ridiculous, and it's an exaggerated model, but it shows the power of this kind of open kind of environment. So there is hope and there is ways of kind of, say, doing it, and this is kind of a roadmap where, you know, using hackathons where there's internal and external, and, you know, you kind of figure out kind of how to run first, and get credibility, experiment, because experimentation like, leads to the road of innovation and all of that type of stuff. Do hackathons, set up your own kind of API, you know, maybe even a closed kind of partnership level or extender or whatever. Figure out, communicate, 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 learn, 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 tweak, tweak, tweak. Then you can start maybe doing a little bit of more of a sprint in the next iteration with more products and services available through your app store and then ultimately take off. But this type of stuff can be achieved with not huge spend, but with huge commitment, especially at, at, at Exco level, saying that you can say, look, at, we can have the shot of changing the culture of our organization and moving from, again, someplace where it's not a delight, and not in the case, not a delight to work because we're putting out fires the whole time, not looking after the needs, but also our customers are not very, very happy. So you can kind of go to your organization saying, look, at, let's try it, and there is a hope and within kind of 18 months, we're starting getting to where there's something really of value for, for an organization. So my kind of take then on kind of where the RIP, you know, the, the tombstone is, the banking tech and operations needs to move from this kind of very restrictive to a little play in the world, a restful state. But not just restful, it needs to be kind of um, uh, uh, resilient, to use a um, word from the Lloyds Bank early on, you know, we as an, or, uh, an industry, you know, continue, especially in the ops, are always putting out fires rather than focusing. So we move from this insane environment where we're really looking at kind of information as a value and we move from something very painful to something very personal. So the RFP of banking of old needs to move to this kind of newer one. And with that newer one, I think there is hope uh, for us to move forward and do something very, very different and ultimately satisfy the needs of our customers and delight our customers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do we have questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got a question about culture. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically for Hack Make the Bank, uh, what participation did you get from inside Ulster Bank? And more generally, is it necessary, do you think, for uh, banks to have um, internal co-creators before they know what API platform to offer external co-creators? Um, so we were very lucky in that I had the CEO sponsorship behind the hackathon. But then at Exco, I went through an education of you know, this hack, because again, it's scary, especially for conservative bankers, you know, are they coming in, what are our customer things, reputational damage and so forth. But once you're able to kind of point to um, other organizations like City and so forth, BBVA, they're here doing it, you know, and, and the reasons why were they doing it. And all of a sudden, while we had sanitized customer data that were not being linked into, there was no direct feed into our core systems, you know, you de-risk it. But it was scary. Uh, on the behalf of the Exco to, sit, to sign off on this, but there was a belief in, in it. I also told them, it says, we're not going to solve any specific problem. You're not going to come from the hackathon with a solution to problem X. But what you will have is the potential to show the art of the possible. So again, over a weekend, if you get out of the way, look at what you can achieve. Now, how can you bring that back into the organization and show the art of possible? And, and without getting into which technology stack or all of those, I would suggest a, a core team and just get stuff done and not 
not look at the 20 million project, you know, to build a full enterprise, you know, all of the APIs. Let's figure out, let's align with some business need, and can you do at the edges? Again, if you're trying to figure out change in large banks, try it at the edges before you move in, because the nearer you are to the core, the further up and the cost, and the further out the delivery. So focus at the edges. And then that shows examples, and people are happy, and it says that it's not all, all kind of fluffy stuff that you can actually affect change. And communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs>